Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Drew Peer. Drew is the VP of Sales for Jiga. Uh, Jiga is a software company that helps hardware companies manage their sourcing data. Drew, welcome to the pod. Appreciate you having me. Appreciate you coming on. So uh, I'll be honest, I thought you were going to be from Israel when uh, Gal Limbar made the introduction. Surprising, I know. I'm uh, a Midwest boy through and through. Always Sweet. have been. I uh, live in Chicago, but uh, our company is based in Tel Aviv. The three founders started everything there. We can obviously get into more details about that later, oh, but uh, awesome. yeah, in <laughs> Chicago and, and visiting Pittsburgh. Sweet. So I guess you have a mechanical engineering background. Uh, obviously, you've done pretty well in sales. What does that transition look like for a person, like going from being an engineer to a salesperson? Great question. Uh, so... I think uh, my entire life, I, I assumed I would be in a very technical engineering role because I was always, you know, like super focused on uh, math and science and engineering and things like that. Uh, but over time, through my my the early years of my career, I kind of realized that I like the technical side, but perhaps that's not where my main strength lies. So I. Uh, decided to make the transition over to the sales uh, side of things, technical sales, uh, where I still dabble in the, the technical world a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's been, it's been, I think, uh, a big adjustment for sure, but, but good so far. Sweet. How long have you been in like a, like a straight up sales role? Uh, I would say, so at my past job, I was there for 10 years. Oh, wow. And the first five were purely technical, and then the second five were sales. Okay, so that sounds like somebody almost told you you should be doing this, if I had to guess. You're not wrong. Yeah, there <laughs> was definitely some uh, whispers in my ear, like perhaps this may be the, the best path for you, uh, given you know what we, what we see your strengths are. But you know, I think that's, that's actually an important thing to bring up is I don't, really think I would have taken the career path that I've taken if I didn't have kind of the, the mentorship of, uh, his name is Don Davies. He, he oh, doesn't cool. work uh, at the company anymore, but yeah, I was definitely guided kind of towards from engineering towards sales and, and definitely, uh, would not have been what I would have thought to do with my career, but no regrets so far. That's awesome. Was was Don in like the sales department or was he? Yeah, yeah. He actually, uh, so this is with my past company uh, selling CAD CAM software. And, Sweet. And uh, he's the one who actually interviewed and hired me. And I think he was typically looking for a very specific type of hire uh, for, you know, technical people with an engineering background that perhaps had a, a penchant for talking to people, solving problems, and not just, you know, focusing on very, very detailed uh, coding and, and things like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, of course. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think he, he saw something in, in me and, and in others that others uh, may not have seen. And he was very uh, adamant that that was the path that he saw in me. And I think... Uh, I wouldn't have made that move if it wasn't for kind of having that mentorship. For sure. That's awesome. So what, did he tell you he was, you were going to kind of be taking this route like from the beginning of the, your time at the company? Or? I think so. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least within a couple of years, it was very clear that he saw uh, an, an opening in, because at the time we had a, a very mature sales force at the company that, you know, a, most of the the people in the sales team were 15 plus years and so you know perhaps he was looking for uh, a little additional spice to that team but uh yeah yeah i think from day one it was clear that's that's where he saw me fitting in that's awesome do you find there's any of the analytical type brain from like the engineering side that comes in handy in tactical sales i mean i know it yeah. does for me but I Kind of curious from your perspective. A hundred percent. And I think for better or for worse, um, I think sometimes that uh, is incredibly helpful. You know, I think 
with large sales and with with selling to established companies, you're looking to solve problems. And so that is, of course, helpful with an engineering background because that's what I was trained to do is solve problems and go through every single little detail and figure out the best, most optimized path to uh, towards a solution. But that being said, I think sometimes it gets me into trouble because uh, <laughs> in like a little bit too analytical sometimes i'll be like for instance on a demo of a product and somebody says you know ask me a specific question and i'll just dive in and be like yeah of course and we can do it this way and like the way that we built it was because we uh we heard from other customers that you know just like diving way too deep and so that's the danger you get into when you're transitioning from technical to sales is like you don't always have to be so detailed, so analytical. Sometimes all you need to say is yes or no, and that's it. So it's been tough, honestly. I don't know to, if I uh, could do that. It, it, I'm not gonna lie. It's that's one of the hardest parts in switching from engineers to sales, engineering to sales. So far, is that I just I struggle to just not say too much. And maybe I'm doing that right now. You never know. No, you're good. <laughs> I mean, the whole point of the podcast, right, is to, to kind of riff and yeah. learn about who you are as a person. So I think it's, yeah. uh, it's totally cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely taught me a lot about myself. And, you know, uh, we talked about this uh, previously, but I moved recently from a larger company to working for a startup. And even that, you know, again, taught me so much about what I should and should not do in my role. And uh, just know, a benchmark, I, like how big was your last company? And not yeah, that, yeah, good question. Off, so uh, for the majority of that five years uh, in that sales role, well, you know, 10 years total, five in engineering, five in sales, uh, it was around 200 people or so. Okay, that's not nothing. Yeah, yeah, definitely, you know. Can you say, like, how big Jiga is, just for... Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So, Jiga is about 12 people right now. Cool. Um, so, you know, certainly it's substantially smaller than what... So, like, uh, a 20th of the size. Yeah. Of the last place. Yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, I think it's it's uh, important to to note that the the company i was working for was 200 people and like you definitely felt you know that you were you were making an impact um but when you move to a company that is in the dozens or like dozen a dozen <laughs> yeah. in, in my case like every single thing that you do affects the future of the company so you feel a lot more pressure for sure makes sense but at the same time you also feel so much more impactful in that everything you do is important you know what i mean and yeah like it has the ability to exactly sink or swim the company exactly yeah. and like I think that I, that is exactly what I was looking for <laughs> in making the switch to a smaller company is I wanted to be able to establish my own processes. I wanted to build something from scratch. I wanted to prove that I could, you know, sell something that didn't already have decades of background behind it. And, uh, I'll tell you what, it, it's not been easy, but it, that I, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I, it brings up a question for me, which is, I guess, what are some of the processes you've put into place or some of the ways you wanted to see things done? And I guess I'll kind of get into what brought you to those conclusions once you start talking about it. But yeah. I'm kind of curious what that looks like for you. I think coming into it, I had grandiose plans. Makes sense. So I get yeah. there sometimes myself. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you start at a new company, anytime yep. you start a new job, it's going to be different. You've this got time. your thirty day, sixty day, ninety day, one year plan. You've got all these things that 
you know, part of it perhaps is like, I'm going to prove that I have a plan. I'm not just going to wing it. Uh, but when you join a startup, especially of this size, those plans are just, the, you can't stick to that plan. It, there's just, <laughs> it's just impossible. Makes sense. You have to be extremely fluid, extremely flexible. And so to your point or to your question about, you know, what have I built? I think I had a whole plan of what I was going <laughs> to do, but it just what I've since done is just react to what the market has asked of us to what that makes sense. All these customer conversations have led to, um, yeah. I, I, sometimes people will ask me kind of like what the next big project I'm going to be working on is and to which I often reply, it's not up to me, it's up to the market. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I feel like that's good because I mean, you can have any plans or designs you want, but if nobody wants to buy it, then absolutely. What's the point? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, and like I said, you know, I'm used to selling a product from a company that everybody knows in the market uh, and instead you have to be unbelievably flexible you have to change your your messaging from one conversation to the next you have to change your marketing strategies from one week to the next you cannot stick with one thing because that's what worked in the past it just does not work at a startup makes sense yeah how do you sort of gauge what's working and what isn't and, and sort of steer that ship as it were like do you just hit a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what's getting responded to or yeah what good does that question look like? good question um i think it requires a lot of reviewing your calls regularly you know i think uh Never before have I been so analytical in watching, re-watching the calls and, and, and conversations I've had with customers to just truly dig in and find every single little thing that they may have said, but during the conversation, maybe I was at the time focused on the next thing I was going to say instead of you know, truly listening to exactly the problem that they were digging into at that time. And that's the only way for a startup to truly solve the problems that they're focused on in the market is to 100% truly understand the problems that they're trying to solve and the personas and people that they're solving those problems for. So I think that's the number one thing that I've learned is how to become a better listener and nice. to ask better questions and to dig deeper into you know, why people are even talking to us in the first place. That's awesome. Yeah. I guess I, I feel like I need to get better with that because sometimes um, I've come up against clients that didn't want calls being recorded. So mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to revert to notes. Sometimes they're yeah. okay with it and, and you listen, but then you just have to be really disciplined about listening. So that's, that's quite a gem to hear you say that. So. Yeah. Yeah. What I'd recommend, there's some softwares out there that, uh, integrate with zoom and they'll just like throw out a disclaimer to the people that you're talking to like hey just fyi this call is recorded for recording and uh monitoring purposes whatever which is totally true because you're trying is totally to improve true. quality exactly <laughs> and like i'm purely using it for my training purposes um but yeah it's i never ever 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 listened back to myself talking to customers until this job and nothing has made me better at that than listening and reviewing what i actually said and learning from past mistakes i might start doing that i think you should yeah i think i should too yeah <laughs> uh, after the after the thing i'm kind of curious to get the name of that extension yeah, yeah i will cool thanks i will cool so um what made you think to start doing that? Just because that's such a gem and it sounds like you didn't do that in your last job. Was that your idea? Was that something you read in a book? Was that something like a colleague directed you to do? Yeah, good question. Um, so our company is a global company. Right now I am 
in the US. The founders are in Tel Aviv. We have developers in Ukraine. We have marketing person in the Philippines. We, we're all over the place. Awesome. So because of that, when I'm taking calls and talking to clients and potential customers, they're probably in bed sleeping and <laughs> vice versa. Yeah, makes sense. So the only way that they can understand what's going on and that I can understand what's going on with them is for us to share videos and you know sh share recordings and makes and a lot of sense. Very detailed notes and so yeah, I think uh, it was mostly kind of just by forced circumstance that we uh, started recording and, and sharing these. But like I said, it's been incredibly valuable. What a nice side effect, though, to, yeah. to introspect and, yeah. and, you know, become better at your job as a result of something that was just kind of yeah. circumstantial like that. That's Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of positives and benefits and negatives to being such a, a, a team spread across the world. Um, but we've really come up with some very effective ways to keep each other accountable, to make sure we're all focused on the same goals, to not constantly be pestering each other, but at the same time understand where each person in the team is contributing and is focused on on a given week, if nice. that makes sense. It kind of does. I mean, I feel like communication's interesting to figure out like the right amount of, right? Yeah. Because you can be overbearing very quickly and easily. Yeah. Um, but I guess I tend to go that way myself with my teams is I'll, I'll over communicate rather than under communicate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always say I'm, I'm kind of old school and that I like to pick up the phone, you know, and yeah, but I think some of my coworkers, like, especially, um, I don't know if it's just the younger generation. I think some people just prefer text to voice. And so 100%. if you're, you know, barraging people with phone calls and they're, they're like a text type, you know, then they kind of get annoyed by that. And yeah. then you have to start texting more and then you get a little annoyed, but then you're like, okay, this isn't so bad. Maybe I'll yeah. adjust a bit. And you know, you just kind of meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So. I'm definitely a team. No phone call if possible. <laughs> like maybe I uh, just like, I'm in the, the younger generation with that or whatever it is. But yeah, I, I prefer, you know, emails, Zoom calls, uh, texting for sure over a phone call. I, I would I put Zoom not. calls almost like more phone you're calling not than a phone call. Yeah, you're not you, have, you have a face also. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But it also feels a little more futuristic. So for I sure. Know, yeah. yeah. But I, I guess my spectrum is like most communication to least communication. Yeah. Like in person, like we are now, is like most. Yeah. And then as a Zoom call, and then as a phone call. Yeah. And then as a text, you know. And it then depends. Maybe like you know, it really depends that. on what you're trying to convey. Yeah. Um, text and email may be the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think um, in sales, you spend a vast majority of your time trying to make sure that you stay on top of each project or each deal or whatever you want to call it and you know different people like different communication modes better and it's it's very difficult to know if somebody is annoyed as hell <laughs> by you calling them or they prefer you email them you prefer you it's just like there's no right answer yeah, there really isn't sense. it's just i prefer email yeah good some email. people don't yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you ever want to reach me email is the way for sweet sure. for text oh well, yeah you can text me if you have my number it's not easy to get no. fair enough <laughs> okay no actually it is it's very easy to get five 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 just yeah, kidding. yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly but um, no, that's that's cool. Yeah, I, I, I guess through working with coworkers that have different styles than me too, like I've gotten better at texting. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's a job I worked recently where, um, you know, picking up the phone just was not favored. So yeah. I'm, I'm a better texter as a result. Like I use emojis more now. Yeah. yeah well, so you have to. Learn how to be communicative in that way. Yeah. <laughs> so. If you don't use emojis, then let's be honest, like, nobody's going to be able to read the 
text and know exactly how you're feeling. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's a actually a really important point. Um, every, like, I think I said this earlier, but every salesperson that at the company that I worked at before, when I first got into sales, they were very, you know, old school, pick up the phone, call the client, check in, like use the phone as much as possible. And if you don't use the phone, you're not doing it right. But that's just not necessarily the case nowadays. But at the same time, there's, I, I, I truly don't think there is anything more effective than a phone call for the quick check-in. Let's get a quick update on the project, on the meeting, on what's going on in the background. Um, I don't think email, I think email is just so much easier to ignore. You know what I yep. mean? But it, it takes a little bit of time to draft an email too because you yeah. want to proofread it and make sure yeah. you're conveying all the information. That's yeah. You're almost building a paper trail a little bit with an email, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, I, I don't know, earlier today I was I was trying to get a tennis game in uh, before work and ended up not happening because of the rain. But I, the one guy texted me and we texted probably back and forth for like five minutes or so. You know, just like, hey, what court are we meeting at? Let's go to this one. I call it this. And what about this one? You know, well, can we go to this one? And I finally, I'm just like, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to call this guy and call him up. And, you know, 10 seconds later, we knew exactly where to go, what we were yeah. doing. And it turns yeah. out we're meeting. But, you know, it's like quick, you know, quick check and done. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, like texting has become the default, even though it's so, so much more inefficient than a 10 second phone call. Yeah. Yeah, but, but then, then again, again, like I, you know, I was running a little bit late for our dinner today. So when I was like three minutes late, you know, you're like got it, you know, that was faster. So true. Yeah, it's, so like, true. it just depends. Like you there's said, no, like, there's no right answer. Yeah, it's just it's circumstantial. Yeah. Well, and that, it goes back to what you said earlier about how you just have to be adaptive and not you know stick to your plan 100 mm -hmm. percent because you know I mean conventional wisdom says a phone call is always the best, but it isn't. Yeah. And if you're okay with, you know, the possibility that you may have been wrong, then you can be a lot more adaptive and just ready to go. Yeah. 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 And that's, uh, that's something I don't struggle at is, uh, admitting that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you can talk to any of my coworkers. I am very open to feedback of my performance and, uh, perhaps that wasn't always the case, but, uh, I think that I've, I've come to realize that any positive or negative feedback you get like is only going to make you better at what you do so there's no reason not to not to yeah. take it to heart i couldn't agree like, more god it was so hard for me so hard for me at first to hear constructive feedback uh and i don't know why it was so difficult at first but like I think it feels like someone's attacking you, like yeah. some people, or if you're just not used to it. Yeah. It, you, I think it feels like a failure. It really does. Yeah. Um, but then you get used to it, you know, and you start to embrace it and realize it's an opportunity for growth. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only the only loophole is if somebody's trying to manipulate you by, you know, telling you something's wrong when it isn't. You know? Sure. Sure. You think you just have to trust your coworkers? Yeah, I was listening to your. Uh, one year later, uh, latest episodes, and you were talking about um, competitiveness and like the fact that you know in, in undergrad or whatever you were extremely competitive with with other people, and and that it took you some time to understand that like you're never gonna be the best at everything, and that's okay. And that has been incredibly difficult for me over the years to accept that like I, I cannot be the best at everything uh, but that's okay <laughs> like to find other people in the team to pass work to when they are better and like uh, yeah that's always been a struggle for me I'm not gonna lie but yeah I, I that was uh interesting hearing you come to the same realization that thanks. i did as well and thanks for listening too i feel like nobody <laughs> listens to this thing at all well you know you come sure. onto a podcast you want to at least see what the interview is going to be like 
But yeah, oh. I mean, I'll, I'll probably become a regular listener at this point. Awesome. Yeah, I hope you do. <laughs> Tell your friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think a lot of the best work that I've done in my career has come from knowing when I'm not the best at mm -hmm. something and, you know, just trusting somebody smarter than me to, to make the right call. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I still don't have that perfected. I you know, I, anybody does really. Yeah. I still am incredibly competitive when I play in a card game with my friends. Like I expect <laughs> to win every game. Like it, there's something wrong with me or I don't know, but uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. But that being said, uh, I think I'm just, I'm coming to realize that like there's, there's no benefit to being super ultra competitive with yourself and like trying to win everything. The benefit is you win if you don't have to do everything yourself. You know, you win if you pass off something to somebody who knows it better because that person gets to show off their abilities and the customer uh, gets to be with somebody who knows the, the subject better. So yeah, that's, 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 and you're the awesome person that handed it off to the right exactly. person for the job. So. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think, uh, I've always had this desire to be able to answer every question, to be able to check every box, to be able to do everything a hundred percent. And uh, I'm slowly realizing that it's just not necessary. It right. makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like perhaps you uh, may feel the same way. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> more and more every day. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, and I think the, the more I'm in industry, too, I mean, it's just a different level. I mean, you know, like listen to other podcasts, talk about undergrad, then grad school, then industry yeah. and i mean you just come up against smarter and smarter people like the deeper yeah. down the rabbit hole you get and yeah i mean you're i hate to say it but i feel like you're almost competing on the highest echelon and mm -hmm. competing is maybe the wrong word but you're you're working with a lot of really really smart people yeah yeah and, and so there's bound to be people that are way smarter than you in different ways you know especially in the manufacturing industry the level of knowledge as you have been in the industry for more years, it's just, it's an exponential curve. Oh, for if sure. If you talk to <laughs> <laughs> Billy Bob, who works at Joe's Machine Shop, who's been there for 40 years, he knows <laughs> more than you will ever know. <laughs> and it's it, like, you have to be able to pass off to the experts know when you don't know things and but at the same time granted i think that's a big challenge for the industry as well yeah for sure well i've i've gotten the comment a lot at work that i ask questions that most people would never dare to ask yeah i use stupid questions like i ask yeah you know what does an acronym mean like yeah. what does that stand for or you know mm -hmm. what's that concept like which might be a basic mathematical or it's at least assumed to be but I think people respect it. Like I, I yeah. maybe some people don't, but yeah. it seems like for the most part, like, you know, I mean, if you clear up the stuff you don't know and you're honest about it, then you can close that gap faster and, and yeah. you know, just build knowledge. I mean, and yeah, I think that's not done enough in the manufacturing industry. I think, uh, there's, there's a big stigma against curiosity where, you know, if, if some, high school guy joins a machine shop and he dares ask questions to the journeyman who's been in the industry for 50 years he gets you know ridiculed and laughed at because he doesn't know things he just like it's like he's in a fraternity and he's yeah. being hazed or something it's, it's like what like, the hell do you expect he just showed up do you want there to be a future to this industry or do you want to just you know have everything die when you retire like that's it that's just kind of uh yeah 
impossible. Well, I do think there's a lot of like older people in the industry um, that are close to retirement age who are, are the opposite of that, at least. Mm-hmm. Like, I've, I've been lucky enough to come across a few folks. I mean, Michelle, who was on my podcast recently, mm-hmm. who's the director of quality at FormLogic, was yeah. saying that she, uh, Michelle Merwin, for people listening, was saying that she really, really likes mentoring, you know, the younger generation. And yeah. I've been really fortunate to have some mentors that are more experienced than myself who've just taken the time to sort of really just accelerate my growth professionally by teaching me a lot. It's You have too, I mean, from yeah. our conversation today. Yeah. And so I don't know that that's always the case, but you're right. In, in some shops, it's just frowned upon to ask cert- certain things. I don't yeah. want to point the finger at, at industries, but I feel like like big aerospace and like defense to some extent seems to favor like three letter acronyms or for sure multi-letter acronyms. And sometimes if you don't know what that acronym stands for, you kind of look like a bit of a, you know, person that doesn't know a lot. Yeah. Um, there's like, but, it's, it's a gated community. If you can't get past that gate of like, I know X, Y, Z, you're not allowed to access my knowledge basically. Yeah. Or that, 100%. you know, a person might have a good idea. But I guess on the contrary of that, if I'm just kind of exploring the idea all the way, mm-hmm. it, it can be time consuming to train someone. So if you're trying yeah. really actively to solve yeah. a problem, sometimes, you know, it, it's, I don't know that you don't have the time, but sometimes it can be, be a bit of a chore to yeah. go back and, and teach. Yeah. But I mean, you're absolutely right. And yeah. I, I found myself in that situation many times in my career to where I find myself being very impatient and very much wanting to just immediately solve the problem so that I can go back to my own stuff uh, when, you know, maybe a, a more junior person asks me something that they need help with. And so I think that that's the natural reaction is you want to just solve their problem for them and move on so that you don't have to deal with it anymore. Yeah, um, makes sense. So, but like, that's really not a long-term solution. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. You're doing the industry <laughs> yeah. a disservice. Yeah, yeah. really. It's it, Yeah, it solves the problem in the moment. But I, I think as you go on in your career, you have to at least put in some time towards helping the people who following who are following in your footsteps to yeah. help them get to where you were at because you know i i had that when i was first starting out and so i i don't know i think it's an unspoken rule of business you know you just you you got to help the people that were in your shoes five ten years ago and it's uh Unfortunately, I think in manufacturing, less common than in other industries. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, if not for the help I'd gotten from, you know, the older generation, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today or yeah. have accomplished half the things I'd accomplished or any of the things. I mean, crap, the fact that we have electricity in here, you know, is, <laughs> somebody had to invent that. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. And there's, there's so many different things that, you know, you're standing on the shoulders of giants that we don't even think about. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, they, uh, it's easier said than done. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, if there's a million tasks to be done and you've been in your job for 40 years, it, it's easier said than done. To yep. take time <laughs> to train and do your job. So... I understand why it's difficult. I really do. But uh, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but if there's any hope for the future of uh, the industry, either that knowledge needs to be transferred directly or it needs to be done by machine learning and AI and yeah. You know, I guess you could write a wiki, but nobody reads that. Right, right. right. I've written so many documents that nobody's ever read. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a a colleague at my last job that he would spend countless hours writing documentation about uh, how to properly run the software platform that we were selling. Uh, 
but at some point he just he came to the realization that like nobody's going to read it. Yep. So that's there for him. It's just <laughs> like, you can put in all these hours documenting and perfectly crafting this tutorial, but it just it nobody's going to take the time to read it. They just they want something that just works instantly and <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about like the idea of, cause I've, I've heard this philosophy and I haven't tried it yet myself, but I have a buddy who runs a production shop. Um, he's actually been on the podcast and sort of lies and, and he makes high end aluminum and titanium buckles for like the bike packing and off-roading industries. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that he uh, is a proponent of is making a video of explaining how to do a thing on a certain machine tool or mm -hmm. how to paint or, you know, how to do a certain process. Yeah. And then having a QR code you can stat scan to get like a YouTube link to the video. Interesting. Do you think that that could be viable or do you think it's still likely to just get ignored or passed over? You know, I think, uh, unfortunately, probably likely to get passed over. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I applaud the effort. You know, I think that yeah. things like that are well worth the effort. If you are actively trying to solve this problem of the knowledge gap, like then bravo to you, regardless yeah. of if it's actually going to work or not. You are trying. Well, and I feel like when you <laughs> teach, even if it's to a brick wall because you're trying to document yeah. um, and nobody reads it, you yeah. know, you're still improving your own understanding 100%. like maybe when somebody asks you now 100%. you've got your canned answer because you wrote it down and you yeah. still might resent them a little bit for asking you something yes. that you documented so they wouldn't have to ask you but you know yeah. you're going to explain it way quicker because you've yeah, already they gone through the they, exercise they always say the best way to learn something is to teach it agree and so like yeah if if you try and teach somebody something but they don't take the time to learn it at <laughs> least you learned it better yourself you know, yep. it's like hundred the, percent. There's a silver yeah. lining there, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting because I'm thinking of um, again, as uh, Ariel recommended me this book called The E Myth, which mm -hmm. is uh, I think it's about like Ray Kroc's approach to making McDonald's be able to be run by anybody so mm -hmm. long as they're willing to follow procedures. Yeah, and so um, him and I have been sort of making a study out of applying that to some of the operations and in, in our businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's inconclusive at this point, at least for me. I, I, yeah. I'd be curious to kind of see, because that, that sort of contradicts what we're saying, but at the same time, I feel like there's got to be a way to make it work. 100%. And yeah. like, uh, when you're trying to grow a, a business and grow a startup as well, you have to build processes. You have to try and put down on paper what worked and what didn't. And so regardless of if somebody listens to it or not, you have to try because there's no other way for you to scale what has worked than to nail down and write down on paper, this is the exact steps I took to go from nothing to something. And whether they follow it or not, that's on them. Yeah. But if you know it works, then if they don't follow it, that's <laughs> it's very obvious that you know that it's just yeah that's on them. But at the very least, maybe like if somebody comes in to replace you at some point in the future, they'll be able to dig into those archives. Yeah. And yeah. You know, oh, too. here's a gold mine. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. And maybe they'll uncover something new that they wouldn't have otherwise. They would have been reinventing the wheel. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's, I think, as well, a big part of the role in joining a startup is, uh, you know, figure out what works, document it, prove that that documented process works, and then scale from there and grow the team and train people on that process and, you know... So even if it's just a reminder yeah. to you on how to do the training, that's still a useful exercise. Absolutely. That makes Absolutely. sense. And so that's been something challenging for me. There's no doubt because I have always had a process that I've followed. So that's how I know that building a process is worthwhile. 
and following a process is worthwhile. So at this point, you know, working at a startup, I know that it's worth taking the time to document and write down what is working and what is not, and to take the time after every single call to make adjustments to that process if things are clearly not working. You know yeah. what I mean? That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. It's it's easier said than done. I'm For not sure. Lie. What? Yeah. After you, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just gonna say like when you get off a call, the default thing you want to do is just uh, go walk around the house for a minute and just like, you know, shut down. But that's the number one thing that I would suggest is right after you get done with a call, try and recall what worked, what didn't, and write it down. Log it into your process. Adjust your process if you already have one established. Interesting. Yeah. So when I have multiple people on a call on my team, what I always, like 100% of the time, my SOP is to debrief at the end of that and yeah. say, let's take 15 minutes to talk about what worked, what didn't work. Is there anything we're missing here? What that's could we great. be doing better? What are our next steps? You know, yeah. what's, that's basically it. But it sounds like you're advocating a step further, which is if you're on a call solo, then analyze it internally. Yeah write it down and and just adjust your process so that's that's actually good for me to hear because i feel like yeah i'm almost using other people as a crutch a little bit to do that in my own work and well I have to be able it to makes do that it easier solo practitioner. for sure when you have somebody else there to kind of police you but when it's just you and a client the client isn't going to tell you what you did right or wrong. correct you know it's 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 on you to reflect and be honest with yourself like, yeah, you shouldn't have said that. Or, yeah, you were a little too salesy. You should have focused on them more. You should have been more focused on discovering and digging into what their problem was instead of talking about your own product. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's much easier said than done, as I've said several times tonight. Yeah, like, I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very important part of dialing in that the process that works is that you reflect on your own performance in an honest way and you say dude that was a shitty call like why did you say that you shouldn't have said that and here's what you should have said instead and just be honest with yourself because if you're not then you're not helping anyone you know that makes a lot of sense it almost sounds like it's the same thing that you would do with a team. You just have to be willing to kind of have that dialogue with yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And which requires a lot have, of trust in this machine. Yeah. <laughs> don't have a big ego about, you know, how amazing you are and how <laughs> like the best that's ever done yeah, it. The best that's like, ever been. No one's ever going to be better than me. Yeah. It's just it's not going to serve you in any way Amen. to be egotistical and to think you're hot shit it's not at all gonna help you yep couldn't agree more yeah and that's uh that's been a constant battle for me in my career i think is me versus my ego fair well you know you've done some good stuff thank you appreciate that <laughs> but i mean i think the natural tendency is if you achieve something or you do an awesome project yeah. or you do right by you yeah. know a company or a person or a client or whatever and you solve their problem, you feel like a hero, it's easy to rest on your laurels and yeah. just be like, all right, well, I've done it. I've accomplished everything. My work here is done. Yeah. But that's the opposite of what you want to do. I mean, to to relieve yourself of duty, maybe a little bit. Like, it's, it's okay, I think, to For light sure. up a cigar and be happy about the work you just did. But you can't... Yeah say you know my career you know like there's this there's, is it <laughs> you, know, like, you are allowed to celebrate your wins no question and you should because work is hard work is a lot of your life and like if you can at least celebrate the good times then it's just gonna be a grind 
for a long, long time. Amen to that. Uh, but, yeah, it's, you can't rest on your laurels. You know, it's just because you succeeded once doesn't mean you'll succeed again. Doesn't mean that you are the greatest salesman of all time, that you're the greatest <laughs> podcast host of all time. It's just like, you, it, it doesn't mean anything if you did an amazing job last week, a month ago, a year ago. It doesn't Yesterday. matter. Yesterday. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Just like, it really doesn't. Well, maybe Agreed. that's just my sales mentality because... You know, I think it's the right mentality. I mean... <laughs> All that matters is what you're doing right now. I mean, and yeah. like you said, it's okay to draw confidence and celebration from your past achievements, but you can't yeah. well, I think, be definitive with I it. I think that's the hardest thing for me is I am very able to celebrate my wins, no question. But to draw confidence, like you just said, that is the difficult part for me. I always have a lot of imposter syndrome. We talked about this Same, a little bit yeah, early before. We did. Is I don't know if it's because I started an engineer and then moved into sales and now I'm like trying to be this vice president, executive, whatever you want to say. Like I constantly am battling with like, am I deserving of this station that I've gotten to in life am i deserving of this position this role and that is i think is very separate from celebrating your victories and the ego side of things like like i said when i win i'm very happy i can <laughs> easily celebrate but I, I i still constantly find myself uh questioning like have i earned this Am I deserving of this? Like, I don't know. It's that imposter syndrome. It's just yeah. constantly creeping in. And I, I, I get that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, especially if I'm walking into a place where there's a lot of really smart people. Yes. You know, I wonder, am I good enough to be here? Or, yeah, yeah certain stations I've held, like, you know, do I really deserve to be a director? You know, right. like, did I, have I earned it? I, I know people that worked for way longer than me in this field that took them, you know, twice as long to get to that station. I don't think I'm good enough, really. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I, I wonder about that. Right. And so I, I don't know. It, it, it's got to be healthy in some way, I think, to, to not be totally. It is. It keeps your ego in check for sure. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, it's definitely, I think, harmful because, you know, especially in a sales role. You have to be confident 100 percent that what you are selling and what you are doing is you know 100 percent what you believe in and i've said this for my entire career i could never and will never sell or work for a company slash product that i don't believe in 100 percent agree ever not just not just because like out of moral reasons but like i i would be terrible I to, like, if, if I worked for a company that gave me a billion dollars for every sale I made, but I didn't believe in it, like I would never make a sale. <laughs> just straight up. I, I just would never do it. Uh, so it, it's partially because of that. And I feel like for a billion dollars, I'd find a way to convince myself that I well, believed in that thing. Yeah, but you're not wrong. You're not yeah. wrong. Perhaps that's a bit hyperbole. But yeah, I'm like... I, I pride myself on believing that what I am selling, what I am offering to people is something that will make their day to day life, their job easier. And so it just focusing on that is much easier to shoo away the imposter syndrome because you're just like, okay, don't worry about that. Worry about like, are you helping this one client solve this one business challenge that you have talked about with them? And like, that's, that's all that matters. Doesn't matter. Like what title you have, what job you have, where like none of that matters. 
so it's it takes a little manually refocusing <laughs> to get back to that point but yeah it's 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 a constant challenge for me i'm not gonna lie yeah well that makes a lot of sense too i, I think i mean i've walked away from i don't know i think this is probably a good thing like i've been in sales scenarios where somebody was asking for something that my team couldn't do mm -hmm. and it just wasn't a good fit and i i usually I'll just say so. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a time when I didn't unless I felt like maybe, maybe the extenuating circumstances, if I feel like it's a fishing expedition mm. and I think the person's just trying to collect data, but has no intention of buying, then I might fuck with them a little bit. <laughs> but if it's, if it's a serious, you know, yeah. like honest conversation, yeah. I mean, which most of them are, let's be honest. I mean, yeah. like, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm, the first one to say if, if what I'm, you know, what I'm the product I'm standing behind the team I've got to bring in to solve this problem isn't the right one for the job. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that trust, I mean, like if you're sincere, I mean, people realize that. And I, I think that, yeah. you know, that builds confidence with, with the customer. Yeah. There's nothing more effective. Granted, you know, I've only been in sales for uh, at this point, six years. There's nothing more effective than brutal honesty and transparency. I think it shocks customers. It shocks them and prospective customers. When you tell them the 100% honest truth and you don't bullshit them, like even if it means it's not gonna be a sale, like it's refreshing. Yeah, for sure. That's what people want these days. They don't want to be hitched they don't want to see this like perfectly smooth uh presentation they just want a conversation they just want like hey can you help me or not no okay thank, thank you guys. yeah do you now i know i can you? trust you <laughs> exactly. like, it's like oh maybe you should like go check out xyz company yeah maybe they're like kind of our competitors but they can probably help you better than we can like the, I, I swear by that being the best way to live your life as a salesperson. Like yeah. Just do not bullshit and be honest because over time, your reputation will precede yourself. Thank you. And it's just, it's, it's just, uh, I've worked with some salespeople over the years that will basically do whatever they got to do to make a sale. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality for a lot of the interactions that our customers have with salespeople. So they build up this expectation that there's a good likelihood that this salesperson is bullshitting. Me. Correct. That they're lying to me. Yes. They're saying exactly what I want to hear because they want my money. So I am constantly battling with that. Oh, Jesus, me too. Right. It's just like, it sucks, but like that's the, that's the stereotype. That's the reality of what has become expected of people in sales. And I've met salespeople. Like I'm sure you have too. Where you've yeah. been pitched by some asshole that thinks that way. Yeah. And it just it gives all of us a bad name, and that's yeah. that's the unfortunate reality of it. Yeah. Truly. And so I'm uh, I'm crusading against stereotypical salespeople. I think that's the right thing to do. Yeah. But it helps that I have the engineering background. But, you know, again, it, it gets me in trouble. <laughs> like, sometimes I'm like, just dig too far into the details. But, yeah. you know, it is what it is. Well, I, I had another um, salesman turned engineer, or sorry, engineer turned salesman. Uh, this whiskey is clearly hitting me now. But I had, I had another engineer turned salesman on recently, and... I kind of reflected something to him that I believe to be true, which is like, it helps to have that technical knowledge because you can sort of be, he's yeah. like, no, no, stop. You're thinking too much like an engineer. Like, exactly. you're wrong. Like, the technical knowledge doesn't matter. What matters is can you be an ally to your customer? Yeah. 
and you know, can you get them to the right people and the right information to help them solve their problem, yeah. regardless of if you have it all in your own head. Not to mention, I think uh, at this point, a lot of buyers expect to constantly have to be passed off. They talk to uh, the person that cold calls them. They have to be passed off to the <laughs> account executive. They talk to the exam account executive who doesn't know the answer to a technical question. They have to be passed off to the engineer. Jesus. They're constantly <laughs> having to be pushed to the next person and they can never get the, the information they're looking for. So I think having that technical background mixed with the sales abilities is unbelievably beneficial to not just you as the technical salesperson, but to the people that you're selling to. And so if I am looking for salespeople to hire, I think, uh, <laughs> an engineering with sales was like the perfect mix. And like, yeah, it's, 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 uh, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Jigo is looking for technical salespeople, engineers that have yeah, the yeah. ability to sell. Call me up, 952-221-6851. Oh wait, I said it was hard to get my number earlier. <laughs> we can bleep that out if you want or leave it in. I said hard, but I meant like you have to listen to a whole podcast. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> yeah. That seems like a good note to end on. Should we, should we like, is there anything you want to plug and then we'll, we'll call well, it? Well, yeah, I guess we haven't really talked about Jigga at all. So oh, should we do perhaps that Perhaps we should do that. Touche, I'm sorry. No, it's all good. It just was such a harmonious, like, nice notion. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. But let's let's go into it. Okay, so yeah. when I first saw Jigga's software on your website, I, I thought, you know, this looks a lot like paperless parts, which mm -hmm. is a product we used uh, at a company I worked for that did manufacturing to be able to line up all the parts we were making. Mm -hmm. And you were like, yeah, it's sort of like that, but... Only yeah. if you're the customer. So yeah. what is Jigga? Yeah, paperless parts is great software platform for sure, but it's mostly focused on the supplier side. Yep. On managing their jobs and their quotes. Jigga is the opposite. It's it's built for the buyers, the people who are looking to get parts made. So right now that process is very time consuming because most people are managing it through direct emails to dozens of different suppliers. Guilty. Yeah, you've lived that life. <laughs> yep. You know what it's all about. <laughs> it's like unbelievably time consuming, but, and you know, it's especially when you have a large organization where you have an engineering team, a purchasing team, a supply chain team, the manufacturers, it's just, it's very difficult to juggle these hundreds of emails, especially when you're ordering, you know, thousands of parts a year. Uh, if you're like doing a lot of prototyping and a lot of, of part ordering. Um, so it's, it's a problem that is rampant that not a lot of people are, have, have, uh, tried to solve because it's like, yeah, we're getting by with emails and spreadsheets. But when you look at what solving that problem actually means, and it's, you know, dozens of hours a month that you can save on administrative costs yep. and like better prices, faster lead times. Duplicated like, effort because somebody doesn't know about yeah. the email chains that somebody else has going on. Exactly, exactly. So it's like, it's one of those problems that never felt solvable, I think. So people just like kept doing it the same way they've been doing it. Uh, but every conversation that I have with a prospective customer is like, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we can like manage all this like in a actually uh, organized way. Makes sense. And, uh, you know, I think there's, a, there's a, also a lot of uh, potential suppliers out there for like on-demand manufacturing platforms and you know, those are great for sure for, for simple orders as well. But I think another problem that we're focused on solving is direct connection between engineer and design team and then the manufacturing suppliers themselves and helping to build that, that lasting partnership yeah. and, uh, you know, helping them 
foster that that uh, long term partnership. So how does Jiga change that relationship? Because I, I can understand mm -hmm. having a database to keep track of all the different vendors that do X, Y, and Z, and yeah. you know ongoing chains and POs that are out and when yeah. they're expected back and all that. But how do you improve the relationship itself? Good question. Uh, number one thing I think is putting data into the buyer's hands so they can immediately see of the dozens and dozens of suppliers that I have worked with, here's the supplier who's the most responsive, who gets me quotes immediately, who delivers parts on time. So they know, okay, this is a real relationship. This is a partner. This is a supplier who cares about actually delivering on the promises that they, you know, gave to me up front. And they can immediately see, okay, just because I've ordered parts from the third, fourth, and fifth company in the list doesn't mean that they actually give a shit about me. Like, yep. so I think having that data about supplier performance is, is the number one thing. That's interesting. So you just have a metric that you use to rank supplier performance, basically? It's an automated that? system that basically says, does this supplier respond to my messages quickly? How quick are they to respond to my quote requests? Do they deliver parts on time? 100% automated. I don't have to like manually type in numbers or anything like that. And when I look at my supplier list, I can say, this is the supplier who has the best results. This is the one I want to work with. That's awesome. I'm just thinking of ways that it didn't go well in like <laughs> yeah. certain, uh, so okay, so like the old way of doing things. I mean, there's, there's one vendor in particular I dealt with at, at a past life um, who me and another coworker came together and said, hey, did you get parts back from vendor X? Yeah. I'm not going to say the name of the vendor because of how they come out in the story, but, and this other coworker goes, yeah, but there were quite a few issues. Well, what were the issues? Well, um, it was manufacturing partners. So they went, well, parts were threaded with the wrong tap, yeah. you know, and yeah. the wrong tap, how, how do you fuck that up? You know, and like, I like they gave me parts with the wrong aluminum alloy. I asked for 7075 and they gave me 6061. Yeah. And my colleague goes, what the fuck? You know, and so we had to put in the QMS to ban that supplier. That was how bad it had to get before we realized, you know. Yeah, because you weren't. It, just anecdotally, it was you didn't horrible. Know anything and about we it. were talking shit in the office. 100%. That was it. But yeah. I mean, how many great ones did we not notice were great? Or how many, yeah. you know, underperformers did we not know to sort of taper off orders with? And, yeah. and how much sooner could that have been avoided? Most companies we talk to, they're just doing it by like tribal knowledge. You know, it's like ooh, <laughs> tying back to what we talked about, you know, the old guy in the shop that has all the knowledge, like he knows the best sh shops to order from. He knows like which suppliers have the fast response times, but there's no actual data being tracked in most companies. Yep. Uh, so just like having that visual got to talk to jim bob yeah exactly which <laughs> you know that's good for his job security but like not perhaps good for the future of our company you know? yeah. so, so. or even the present because now jim bob is a bottleneck every single time exactly yeah exactly yeah and you know i think another big thing as well that we see is most companies when they're ordering parts it's a very uh, disconnected process. So the obviously engineers and sourcing and supply chain and, and manufacturers all need to be involved. But right now, because it's typically done by emails, it's very disconnected. And so it's very difficult to make sure that the right people have all the right information at the right time there's a lot of email God forbid forwarding. somebody wasn't CC'd. Yeah, email. and like file revisions and like, yeah, it's just... It's, I'm giggling because it's I can think of some examples of like Rev 6 of, yeah. of a part, you know. Yeah, you download the wrong file. And, and even Rev 6 like, has issues. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So 
I think that there's there's no question whatsoever that, like I said, every prospective customer that I'm talking to these days about what we're trying to solve at Jiga is like, where the hell have you guys been? <laughs> like, we have needed this problem solved for a long time. Uh, and so it's it's extremely exciting to be a part of an organization that is solving a rampant problem. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. to actually feel like you are helping people every time you pick up that phone, every time you sit on a Zoom call with somebody to, like, do a discovery call or whatever you want to call it where you're digging into the problems that they want to solve uh it's exciting it really is that's awesome yeah so yeah i i uh i'd love to like you know dig in more into it but you know i I also don't want to be too salesy so yeah no worries i mean i I said kind of before we recorded this what i what i'm enjoying about like or the reason i think you'll be a good guest is i don't feel like this is going to be a commercial and even though you talked about jig i don't think it is like i don't think that's the point of this conversation and like like we talked about earlier like i'm a very non-salesy salesperson i'm much like like why is salesy like a four-letter word i wonder because i know i don't know that that should be the adjective that describes i know what you're talking about which is a shame but i know exactly what you mean dude when i went into sales i was like kind of ashamed to say i was a salesperson oh geez when i was an engineer i always looked up to the salespeople. yeah i thought they were so cool well that's surprising to me because when i switched from engineering to sales uh, I felt like I was uh, a traitor. Interesting. <laughs> I felt the I felt so good when I got to start doing sales because yeah. I think it's because I like being around people. Yeah. And so I thought yeah. like salespeople are emotionally intelligent. Finally, I'll get this is my ego. Finally, yeah. I'll get acknowledged for my emotional intelligence right. and right. You know, and I'll earn my proper station as not just some guy at a desk plugging <laughs> away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I to think be we, allowed to talk to people. This you know, at the same time, like, I think it's unbelievably important to mention, though, that, like, and we talked about this at dinner, sales is fucking meaningless without engineering, without the development team, without Absolutely. the support team. Like, it's... But I would go a step further and say that all of that is, you know, fruitless without sales. I yeah. mean, it's, it's all symbiotic. Yeah. Everybody needs everybody. Yep. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I think it's uh, unfortunately uh, difficult for everyone on on all sides to understand that. Yeah, but I think, like, the older you get, I mean, at least maybe not everybody. Like, sometimes there are people that don't really see outside their silo. Yeah. But I I don't know. I, I have to believe that, you know, like, a lot of my colleagues seem to understand that, you know, yeah. like... Yeah. I can't even count the number of times. I mean, and that's not that impressive. I mean, it's, you know, what, like at 13 you lose count or whatever. But like, <laughs> right. I, I can't count the number of times that uh, a colleague has, like an engineering colleague in particular, has said, hey, all I want you to do is stand between me and the customer. I don't yeah. want to have to deal with, you know, the client. I just want to be able to solve these problems. Yeah. Great. Happy to do it. You know, yeah. it's, that's the ideal yeah. partnership there. It's like you understand your each other's roles and you do just that role and, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. My role my role is a bit different because I, I sort of do a teeny bit of both. Right. I feel like an air traffic controller is how I feel. It gets complicated for yeah. you, for sure. Well, I'm basically leading teams of folks to go and solve someone's problem. Yeah. So I've got to liaise with that someone and then I've got to talk to the folks. Yeah. And so I'm just a relay is all I am. I'm, I'm, well, you know your role. I'm a middleman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <For> sure. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And on that note of me being a middleman, uh, I feel like that's that's a good note to, to call it. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you having me. I appreciate this you coming on. Fun. Um, is there any like a website or anything else you want to you wanna kind of sound off on? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If you want to learn more information... Uh, go to jiga.io, J-I-G-A dot I-O, or 
Like I said earlier, you can just call my cell phone directly, 952-221-6851. Perfect. Hey, you know, you gotta do it. Absolutely, Drew. Hey, right. thanks for coming on, man. I really yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thanks for having me.